Taylor Finney was one of the most captivating characters in the pro peloton. He wasn't just style over substance, however. He was a rider who reached the top 10 at Paris-Roubaix, achieved world championship medals, a stint in the Malia Rosa, as well as a top 5 performance in the Olympic Games. Most of these achievements came when he was in his early 20s, promising a new era for American cycling. With all that now behind him, we chart the rise and fall of the face of America's post-Armstrong generation, Taylor Finney. Born in June 1990 in Colorado, Taylor Finney grew up around a family of athletes. His father, Tour de France stage winner and Olympic medalist Davis Finney, and his mother, an Olympic gold medalist and former world champion Connie Carpenter Finney. Therefore, a career in sports made sense for Taylor, beginning in track cycling. Quickly enough though, Taylor was competing at the highest level of track racing, riding in the World Cup and World Championships. In fact, his track prowess garnered him a place at his maiden Olympic Games in 2008, at the age of just 18. With this rocketing reputation in the sport, there was still a transition to be made onto the road. In 2009, things got serious for the young American. In Pryszkov, Poland, Finney became the world champion in the individual pursuit at the age of just 18. In 2010, he would repeat this feat in Denmark to become the first back-to-back -back American champion of the individual pursuit. Whilst this was going on, Finney completed another double. He took the youngsters Paris-Roubaix, known as the Paris-Roubaix Espoir, in both 2009 and 2010. As he made his transition to road racing with the Livestrong team, Finney kept the ball rolling with a string of solid results in the youth category, including a bronze medal at the Under-23 Road World Championships and a gold medal in the time trial. After a hurricane of hype in the 2010 season, Finney signed to the BMC squad, managed by family friend Jim Okovitz in time for the 2011 season to begin. Along with his signature, BMC also promised Taylor Finney a specialist bike fit to match his 2 metre height. Regardless, they got their return on their Finney investment in the 2011 season, crescendoing in a stage win and 4th place overall at the World Tour level in Eco Tour. Rightfully branded as a wonder kid at the end of the 2010 season, we were left wondering what step would Finney take next? 2012 threw Finney right into the limelight within the professional peloton. A top 20 in the 2012 Paris-Roubaix was a huge result for the 21-year-old. However, it would be at the 2012 Giro d'Italia that Finney would shine brightest. On the opening day's prologue in Herning, Denmark, Finney rolled out early ahead of most contenders. With confidence though, he flew around the course to secure the win, granting him the Malia Rosa. With a 9 second buffer to second place Garrett Thomas, things were tight at the top of the GC standings. After a close call on stage 2, Finney held the Malia Rosa for another day. However, stage 3 brought more drama in the finale of the stage. As the sprint unfolded, Roberto Ferrari and Mark Cavendish collided, triggering a mass pileup in the bunch, claiming Taylor Finney victim. After sitting on the concrete 100 meters from the line with doctors by his side, we thought Finney's race was in jeopardy. Nevertheless, Finney kept pink. Once back in Italian soil though, the Americans shed the leader's jersey, over to Lithuania's Ramunas Nevadauskas after a chaotic deemed time trial for the BMC squad. However, losing the jersey was much to Finney's relief, at least in retrospect. After having completed his debut Giro d'Italia, his focus turned towards the Olympic Games in London. There, Finney would line up as Team USA's leader in both the individual time trial and the road race, providing a great chance for the American to taste success at the world's greatest sporting spectacle. On the first day of the games, Finney rode with confidence, making the decisive splits in the final 20 kilometers of the road race. In a confusing finale, Finney remained in the hunt for the bronze medal. Roaring down the finishing straight in front of Buckingham Palace though, fourth place would have to suffice. The following Wednesday at the time trial, Finney rolled out with high hopes from the starting gate in London. He looked strong, however the Tour de France stars of Chris Froome and Bradley Wiggins looked like their form was unrivaled on the day. Crossing the line in fourth place once again, Finney was just outside the medals. After these near misses at the Olympic Games, one international medal did come his way later in 2012 at the UCI World Championships in the individual time trial. 
Riding this wave of international success, Finney went into 2013 as one of cycling's hottest properties. After a mixed bag, however, in the early half of the season, Finney redeemed his 2013 campaign with a stage win nonetheless at the Tour of Poland in a dramatic finale. Finney, though, would have to wait until 2014 to taste victory once again this time at the Tour of Dubai. On the opening day's time trial, Finney reinstated his value as a world-class time trialist by sealing the win, defeating the old guard of the TT in Cancellara and Tony Martin. By holding on throughout the race, Finney carried the blue leader's jersey until the very end. With this win under his belt, Finney was amping up for the Tour de France later that year opting for the Tour of California instead of the Giro d'Italia in 2014. This choice bore fruit as Finney soloed away to a victory on stage 5 into Santa Barbara, securing the win in style. With the American Championship scheduled just a few weeks later, Finney remained in the US to compete in the individual time trial championships in Tennessee. With strong form on his side, Finney clinched the Star Spangled Banner jersey. Despite this, Taylor never had the chance to wear this jersey in competition. A few days after securing the time trial title, Finney's career would change drastically on the descent of Lookout Mountain in Tennessee. In a shocking crash during the road race, Finney suffered a compound fracture to his tibia and several patella tendons. Finney's calendar of the Tour de France and World Championships in 2014 were wiped away, and Taylor entered a long process of recovery. You know, whether I liked it or not, I definitely got to, uh, got to a different pain level than I'd ever experienced as an athlete. After initially receiving a recovery forecast of six to eight weeks, reality would dictate that Taylor wouldn't race for another year. After gaining strength, Finney started his comeback in the US with the Tour of Utah. Here, after 14 months without racing, Finney reached the podium on the first stage. This was a huge feat, as Taylor Finney finally found himself back on track. This comeback from injury would only get stronger at the US Pro Challenge just two weeks later. As Taylor Finney wound it up towards the finish, the bandages on his knees indicating the accident he had 14 months ago in the American Road Race Championship, which almost cost him his leg. He was back and he was winning. It was certainly an emotional victory after his injury and long journey back to racing. But with this, Taylor Finney was back in business. With some racing in his legs, Finney was eyeing up the World Championships in Richmond, Virginia. On home turf, Finney was selected to compete for his national team and his trade team, BMC, in the team time trial. On the day, the team in which Finney was the only American roared around the Virginia state capital to secure the gold medal in Finney's first senior rainbow jersey in the team time trial discipline. The line. This is what dreams are made of. BMC Racing Team win the gold medal. Taylor Finney wins a world title in his return world championships a few weeks ago. He didn't even think he would be here. As the reigning world champions of the TTT, Finney excelled with wins at Tirreno Adriatico and the Eneco Tour alongside his BMC squad. However, the rest of 2016 wasn't quite as fruitful as the previous seasons. However, there was a new calling for Finney over at the American Cannondale Drapak squad. In swapping the black and red of BMC to the bright green of Cannondale, new challenges and objectives were offered. Surely, Finney saw a new horizon approaching. In 2017, Finney was greeted by the Cannondale team with an interesting schedule for the year. The American was given the opportunity to race the Cobble Classics as well as the Tour de France. Finney wouldn't light up the early season score sheets, as a DNF in the Ronde van Vlaanderen ruled him out of Roubaix. Instead, Finney focused on making the start line of his debut Tour de France in Dusseldorf. After a strong performance on the opening time trial, Finney decided to reach out for the polka dot jersey on stage 2. Even though he was sitting in 12th place overall, the peloton allowed the American to sweep up the two mountain points on offer in a quest to claim the first polka dot jersey of the 2017 Tour de France. Five years after his last appearance in a Grand Tour leader's jersey, Finney was back on the Grand Tour podium. Even though he only wore the jersey for one stage, it was the progress that was impressive to see. 2018 offered a similar schedule to the former, with the Classics and the Tour de France. During this year, Taylor Finney was carving a name as one of the most popular personalities in the bunch at least for fans. This made him quite the cult favourite among cycling viewers. The Finney fans therefore rejoiced in seeing the American claim an 8th place at that year's Paris-Roubaix. I mean, I just got top 10 in Roubaix, I'm pretty, pretty freaking stoked. 
Deeper into the year, Finney claimed a top 10 on a stage of the Tour de France and kept a relatively low profile in terms of Palmyra's results. The next year in 2019, it wasn't an ideal year in terms of Finney's road cycling results, as his mind moved elsewhere and onto other things. Towards the end of the 2019 season, Finney stated his desire to retire, saying, quote, his passion was away from the bike. Instead, Finney was looking towards different careers and different pathways, notably in the domain of art. Therefore, at the end of the 2019 season in Japan, Finney became a retiree from the world of professional cycling. A future in arts was waiting for him. So what happened to Taylor Finney? Well, he was one of the prototypes of the Wonder Kid generation, emerging in the 2000s as just a late teenager who promised so much on the senior adult level. And yet he retired early in 2019 and moved into a completely different domain. It's certainly a unique story to tell. And I mean, only the man himself could give you a full breakdown. Thank you as well for, for, for coming along and sharing your part of the story at least yeah man of course uh so where are you right now uh i'm at my art studio right now just outside of just outside of girona it's in this town called palol and when you say art studio what kind of what kind of art are you working on is it sort of visual arts music yeah i mean we have like uh, i mean there's a painting that i'm working on right here there's a painting on the ground there's another painting over there. These are paintings that are going to go to this restaurant in Norway. And then we have the whole music studio, like with all the records and the record players over there. Speakers for the, the warehouse raves. Let's reopen that professional athlete trauma. Yeah. And uh, delve, delve into your career. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's You're like a psychologist. <laughs> exactly. This is like a glorified therapy session uh, for the yeah. for Cycling Day YouTube channel. Okay, let's for the, let's for the let's look back your track days in your sort of teenage years and childhood. Was there much mm -hmm. pressure on your shoulders because you you reached such success at, at a young age? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I had like really high standards for myself already, and then. Of course, your standards are also going to be set by the way people talk to you, the way people kind of uh, approach you, what is written about you in the media. So uh, at the same time, I think I liked it, though, when I was younger. I was like, bring it on. I mean, I had a lot more ego when I was younger. And then that was kind of something that dissipated over time, um, which I think is normal. And then looking into sort of your pathway from the track to the to the world tour, how did that come about? Uh, yeah, well, originally I was kind of like, I was racing on the Trek Livestrong team, you know. I had this like, these like couple Uber fanboy years when I was 17, 18, 19. I got a call from Lance Armstrong, who was like my childhood hero. And he wanted to start this under 23 team. And so I was like, yeah, they wanted to pay me. And I was like, that sounds great. And um, so I raced like pro Conti for two years with Trek Livestrong, but we also did under 23 races. And then I was sort of like slated to go to the Radio Shack team, which was the team that Johan Brunil and Lance started. But this was the time when all of Lance's stuff were, was coming out. And I mean, like I said, I was a fanboy, so I was a believer. And it was, I was really stuck between this, like not knowing what to believe in sort of at this point. BMC came to me with a really nice offer. They told me they would build me a custom bicycle because I'm almost two meters tall, which they didn't end up doing. But you know, when people are courting you, they're gonna tell you what they want you to hear. And yeah, I had one conversation with Lance and Johan and Lance and Johan both hang, hung up the phone. I mean, I was 19 years old sitting on my, on my trampoline, like <laughs> trying to tell my childhood hero that I didn't think I was going to race for his team. And uh, 
they just hung up the phone without saying anything. So that was kind of my first taste of what sports business was like. Yeah, then the, the decision was pretty clear after that. And then I went to BMC, which was run by a man named Jim Akowitz, who was actually my dad's team manager in the 80s. And like somebody that I would, we would go on vacation with, you know, when I was like seven, that felt kind of homey and made sense. Do you have much contact with Lance at all nowadays, or is that kind of cut off? No, I haven't really, I haven't really talked to him since the, since I was sitting on my trampoline like 14 years ago. But I do have to say that Lance, being around Lance, I mean, Lance's house was like a museum art wise and the artists that he was into were people that I'm still into today, like Jose Parla, Damien Hirst, and Shepard Ferry is a, is super famous. And Lance's house and his guest house, like he just had art everywhere. So that was kind of, I would say, my first maybe adult encounter with really cool art. So I do have him in some way to thank for kind of sparking that initial interest. Giro 2012 in Denmark with the opening stage win in Hanning and the Malia Rosa for a couple yeah. of days. What did that feel like for you? Was was that another big box ticked for you? Um, that was incredibly stressful, to be honest. I mean, I was only 22 years old. It was my second Grand Tour. And, but that was a that first stage, you know, I like memorized all of the corners for the time trial because it was a prologue. And so I knew I, you know, it was like part of the plan was to try to win it. Uh, but once I got into the jersey, I was, <laughs> I was just so stressed out about being in the jersey, feeling like I could only lose it. And yeah, I held on to it for a few days, but I like crashed every stage and, uh, I was happy. Honestly, I was like happy to not have the pink jersey anymore after after I lost it, I think, in the team time trial because I was just like, I just need to be off the back for a while and like regain my my composure. But looking back, you know, when I eight or nine years later it was like, yeah, you know, that's that's a huge memory or a huge box to have ticked. Now let's move forward to 2014 and, of course, uh, the big crash at the National Championships. With that crash, there were months of yeah. recovery. What impact do you think that has now in retrospect from where you are today? Yeah, the crash is definitely... Uh, um, there's a... It's a... What do you call it? It's, it's like a pivot moment. I mean, it's... It's a moment, the crash was a moment where, let's say I was on a certain trajectory and then the trajectory just changed completely. And with that change in trajectory came this whole life of art and creative expression, which was perhaps something that was lying dormant inside of me for a long time. And the crash opened the door to that world and then that world just took over and then moving to cannondale did that allow you to explore more about yourself and your sporting uh, sporting exploits and, and your sporting persona yeah i think i mean i think moving to cannondale was sort of my only option it seemed like this place where a lot of people would go to be able to to be themselves let's say within this kind of regimented sport which of course, you still have to be regimented and they still want you to win races and blah, blah, blah. But um, there were more weirdos on the team, I guess. <laughs> um, but there was definitely a good vibe on, on Cannondale. And I think even being able to race things like Unbound and dip my toes into the gravel scene and recognize that actually that's not what I want to do either. <laughs> it was nice to also be able to tick those boxes of like yeah well actually maybe i don't need to just be extreme about endurance all the time and thinking about yourself when you uh, when you decided to retire when when did that decision come and why did you come to that decision 
I would say that the decision to retire was kind of in the, it was, it was a, a fantasy for a while, really ever since I came back from breaking my leg. So three or four years or so of questioning, wondering whether I was doing the right thing by, by doing the same thing that I was doing before I broke my leg. It's a it's a combination of a lot of factors. Um, one, I would say, I was dealing with chronic pain training and racing, and I still deal with some awareness around how one of my legs feels a lot different than the other leg. But when you're training and racing all the time, it's just apparent. It's right in your face all the time, and it becomes obsessive. So I didn't want to obsess about that anymore. And then second, my passion for racing and training uh, had kind of been replaced by a passion for making music and painting and drawing and just exploring really the world. I, when I would go out riding and training and I, I just couldn't be on the road anymore. It didn't. I just couldn't force myself to be like, oh, I got to I gotta do these intervals because I'm going to go to Perry Nice. It was like, I don't care about Perry Nice. And honestly, I don't think anybody cares about Perry Nice. And I've never been down this trail before. And New Trail Day is the best day. <laughs> do you miss it? Do you miss being a professional cyclist? No, not at all. I'm really grateful to have been a professional athlete and to have the experiences, uh, have had the experiences that I've had and made the friendships that I've made. And, you know, it's a very unique life experience to travel the world and race your bike professionally and live within this bubble. Ultimately, it is a bubble though, and it's a very small bubble in, a group of a shit ton of bubbles and I'm so happy now to be able to just tap into a bunch of different bubbles and just explore everything else around because when I was racing I didn't have the time to do that and I've been had basically been a professional athlete since my third year in high school you know so I'd never I'd never had the time to live life as a person who didn't have to update their whereabouts for the doping control agency every day. Like, uh, I never really had that experience until I retired. And so, um, I mean, my career paid for my life that I live, uh, which is awesome. Uh, I definitely paid for that with my body, but, I think as we get older, we our bodies deteriorate anyway, so it's important to know how to take care of them. And for that, I'm grateful to being an athlete as well. Do you think being a professional cyclist is a creative pursuit? There's definitely something very dramatic about cycling, which professional cycling, which I appreciate. I think that there's a there's an there is a certain artistry within cycling. I don't think that the people who are racing their bikes are conscious of the artistry that they demonstrate when they're racing their bikes or just how it unfolds when we get to watch it. Um, I, so I, I mean, cycling is a beautiful sport just for that, but I can tell you from the inside that it's, it's just pushing through pain and, um, bluffing and fucking with people until you win. 